Why are armed government agencies constantly raiding peaceful family farms for producing milk? Hello, my name is Liz Reitzig, and this is a three-part series on raw milk. The history of raw milk controversy in America, how it got to where it is today, and a solution to procuring one of nature's greatest foods. Cattle have been domesticated for over 10,000 years, and Europeans first started drinking raw cattle milk around 7,000 years ago. For thousands of years, the consumption of fresh, nutrient-dense raw milk was never a problem, until recent history. With burgeoning large-scale industry came the need for more workers. Industrialized communities drew workers from farms and the countryside into the cities. And of course, these healthy people still wanted their raw milk. As the Industrial Revolution grew exponentially, by 1810, thirsty workers staffed factories and mills throughout the East Coast. And if you've not guessed by now, milk and whiskey were the beverages of choice. The bigger the cities got, the more demand there was for both. For two years, the War of 1812 basically halted the supply of distilled spirits from Europe. For the common folks, their spirits dried up. To quench the soaring thirst for alcohol, distilleries opened up in most major cities. That is when a cutthroat entrepreneur came up with a disastrous idea to inhumanely confine cows adjacent to distilleries and feed them with a nasty swill left over from the spirit making process. The only way to get the cows to eat this filthy slop was to cut off all food and water and feed them salt to induce thirst. They were force fed cold swill until they grew accustomed to it and then weaned onto hot slop straight from the stills. A substantial percent of the people who drank swill milk from these cows became deathly ill, with many dying. The torturous conditions of the cows confined to cramped, filthy pens, combined with their diet, produced a pale, bluish milk so horrific in quality, it couldn't even be used for making butter or cheese. Put into the mix, sick workers with filthy hands, diseased animals, and unsanitary milk pails, well, you have a concoction for disaster. At this time, basic science regarding germs and microbes was still decades away. The all-too-common contaminated milk was fed to babies by unwitting mothers. And this is where raw milk erroneously got its bad reputation. In 1870, in New York City alone, infant mortality rose exponentially to around 20%. The infant death rate stayed there for several more years as big business profited off swill milk with no regard for human life. The following historical events are rarely told, yet extremely important. The unacceptable rise in infant deaths led to two choices. Higher quality farming practices in city dairies or pushing infected product from unhealthy animals. Instead of addressing the filthy conditions, big business sought to mask the symptoms using additives such as plaster of Paris, chalk, sugar, eggs, starch, flour, and color pigments to alter the swill milk's watery, pale bluish, and foul-tasting natural state. They even had the audacity to label this as pure country milk. Infant mortality languished for years until two men from different mindsets were brought together due to the milk-related deaths of their children. The first, Dr. Henry Coit from New Jersey, urged the creation of a medical milk commission to oversee and certify raw milk production for cleanliness. In 1893, he was finally able to do so. Coit worked with key dairy experts. He and his unpaid team of physicians were then able to enlist dairy farmers who were willing to meet the strict 
Medical Milk Commission standards of hygiene while producing fresh, clean, certified raw milk. Milk was once again safe and available for public consumption. However, it cost up to four times the price of uncertified milk. The second man, Nathan Strauss. New York philanthropist Nathan Strauss had an entirely different view. He believed that only pasteurized milk could be safe. Strauss had made a fortune as co-owner of Macy's department stores and spent decades using his wealth to promote pasteurization across America and Europe. Using unlimited finances, he set up and subsidized the first of many low-cost pasteurized milk depots in New York City. Strauss had incredible influence beyond his wealth to promote pasteurization over healthy and humane farming practices. Strauss was Parks Commissioner from 1889 until 1893, and in 1898 he was President of the Health Board as well as Commissioner of the Department of Health. Sterilizing diseased milk started to gain traction over healthy farming practices. Certified and pasteurized milks peacefully coexisted for over four decades. However, the truce ended in 1944 when a concerted media smear campaign was launched with a series of entirely bogus magazine article attacks dedicated to striking fear into raw milk consumers. Greed and profit lured government officials and medical professionals seduced by corporate dollars and lies into controlling and promoting cheap mass confinement production over healthy, humane farming practices. This basically stopped the supply of nutrient-dense, healthy raw milk from reaching the people. It has only been in recent years that consumer demand and pushback against government-backed, chemical-laden, and low-nutrition processed foods has grown. The fight is for access to healthy, nutrient-dense, real foods. Consumers are now demanding their rights to choose healthy foods from the producers of their choice. Part two of this series, government overreach, gross misuses of abusive power, and draconian measures and attacks on peaceful farmers. Part three, the solution. Thank you.